thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today, I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Orlando Ortiz, who is a neuroradiologist and a professor of radiology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, he's also the chair of radiology at the Kubi Medical Center. Uh, he has won tons of awards and held multiple leadership positions. And I'm sure you will enjoy this talk. Um, I know I will. Um, and please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And uh, in the last 15 minutes of the lecture, uh, we will get to them. And uh, with that, I tell, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ortiz. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the kind invitation that allows me to share some of this interesting material and these concepts with you guys this morning and uh, or this afternoon or this evening, depending wherever you are. Um, I am saying hello from the Bronx, New York. Uh, New York City is one of the world cities and the Bronx is uh, an important part of New York. I'm at Jacoby Medical Center, which is a level one trauma center. Uh, we're always very busy, particularly uh, it's on weekends, it's Friday, it's Friday and, and over the weekend, we will see our fair share of, of head trauma and head trauma cases here. So in terms of learning objectives, what I'd like to do is give you an understanding of the classification of head trauma and the significance of this classification, uh, review some injury patterns and lesion types, and lastly, discuss an important aspect of head trauma, uh, abusive head trauma. Now, in terms of classification, uh, we can look at uh, head trauma as to when it occurs relative to the time of the event, whether it's at the time of the injury or sequelae that occur thereafter. And the, the, the time of the injury may reflect, for example, the heads hitting the windshield and folks who do not wear their seat belts or who are thrown from their car because of that or who are struck by a car or fall off a motorcycle, etc. cetera. Uh, the type of trauma, whether it's direct or indirect is also very important. The mechanism, whether it's penetrating or non-penetrating, has certainly uh, not only clinical, but uh, forensic and legal implications. Uh, lesion localization is extremely important. Uh, we're talking about extracranial, cranial, or intracranial lesions, and certainly intent, whether uh, it's an accidental uh, phenomena or the, the result of, of non-accidental uh, uh, intent. Um, and, and this is actually a, an artifact uh, from a Scout CT uh, study uh, showing uh, the most widest cranium I've ever seen. And it's from, from my, one of my former residents that, at one of my former institutions. And it always reminded me of uh, this character. Uh, his name is Flat Top. He's from the Dick Tracy cartoon series, which was from the uh, 50s and 60s and early 70s. And um, uh, this reminds me to uh, just mention a little bit about uh, uh, trauma in, in terms of uh, type and uh, intent. And in terms of type, we're talking about direct injuries. And this is the uh, characteristic coup uh, type of injury where the impact is ipsilateral to the part of the head that strikes a surface or is struck by an object. And then the opposite side of the brain because it's inside of a, of a hard shell and a skull base, um, uh, the brain shifts in, to the other side um, with, with, with high impact. And then there's a uh, contra coup uh, type of injury. Uh, this is an example of that type of mechanism in this case. Uh, a child that fell and struck the back of the head, as we can see on the bone window algorithms, a fracture through the occipital bone. That's the site of impact, the coup injury, the soft tissue swelling at that site in the skin. And the contra coup component is this hemorrhage in the frontal lobes, uh, the result of the shift uh, in, in, in vector and in energy and the, the mechanism and type of injury uh, in this patient. The indirect types of, of, of head trauma refer to 
these compression distension injuries of the brain and these twisting injuries where there's differential movement and direction of the cerebral tissues. Remember the cortex and gray matter nuclei are filled with cell bodies. So they're very densely packed. So the, so the mass is very high. Uh, the white matter is less dense. And if you uh, apply the same force uh, to these different structures, uh, then the gray matter will ex or cortex will experience uh, a differential acceleration because remember force equals mass times acceleration. And because of this differential mass, the, there's a differential force experience and you get shearing phenomena. Penetrating trauma uh, can occur um, for, for uh, numerous reasons. Usually it's done, uh, it's, it's with intent. And for those patients who survive uh, the, the initial incident, in, incident uh, the sequela can be cr quite devastating and um, it, it, nowadays in the age of automatic weapons, uh, we're not dealing with just one gunshot wound blast. There are often others which are not shown in this case or um, as shown in the case below uh, from the autopsy specimen, uh, these um, uh, cases require uh, some degree of analysis in terms of trajectory and trajectory analysis is very important uh, in penetrating trauma because it does have implications uh, legally and forensically. For example, this is an execution uh, style type of a single shot event uh, for this particular unfortunate individual. Um, now, penetrating trauma need not just be related to gunshot wounds. Other uh, objects can uh, end up uh, lodged within the head. For example, this patient uh, was in a car accident and uh, did well, but had some right periorbital soft tissue swelling, complained of pain with eye movements a couple of weeks later. These are close up views from a, a head CT at the level of the orbital roof. And we see this low attenuation just in, in the uh, medial aspect of the, uh, rather lateral aspect of the middle cranial fossa. And we go to um, uh, uh, some, some bone windows and lung windows actually here. And we get to see the air that's inside of the super, super orbital region. And believe it or not, uh, this turned out to be a piece of wood from a tree uh, that the individual struck during their car accident. So what is the role of imaging in trauma? Well, certainly CT is the mainstay of te uh, therapy and, and evaluation because it's, it's rapid, it's, it's quickly uh, done and it's available. And you can, you can see fractures, you can see foreign bodies. You can certainly see areas of, of acute hemorrhage in the brain. Uh, MRI certainly plays a complementary role, particularly in patients in whom we suspect uh, subtle injuries related to sharing stress, vascular injuries, and obviously in patients who are victims of abusive head trauma. Uh, Hey, plain radiography is still used. Uh, it's helpful to look at fractures, particularly as part of skeletal surveys in, in, in these non-accidental trauma cases. Very helpful at looking at foreign bodies. And lastly, catheter angiography has a role not only in helping to confirm suspected vascular injuries, but for possible uh, immediate intervention. So let's start off from the skin and work our way in a little bit. Um, Cephalohematoma. This is a subperiosteal hematoma. The, the pericranium is firmly attached to the outer table of the skull, and hemorrhages underneath that peri pericranium are contained, are suture limited, and are referred to as cephalohematomas. Um, these can occur, occur as a result of, of, of direct head trauma, uh, and they can also be seen uh, during uh, a child delivery. And Again, on CT, for example, we see focal soft tissue swelling, suture delimited in a patient with a cephalohematoma. Now, why am I making a big deal of this? Well, this is our first teaching point. Number one, the cephalohematoma not only suggests possible head trauma, but it is a clue as to the site of impact. It helps you commence your search. And uh, this is an example 
of a cephalohematoma that's uh, chronic from uh, vaginal delivery. And this actually was resected and you can see the organized clot within that uh, uh, cephalohematoma in, in that child. Subgalo hematomas, these are collections beneath the gala, another layer of the scalp. And these can be associated with skull fractures as well, often seen post-surgically. And uh, caput succedaneum is mentioned here. Um, this is hemorrhage and edema in the soft tissues of the scalp, also often associated with vaginal deliveries, but another form of scalp uh, soft tissue swelling. Let's look at some examples. Uh, a patient uh, with head trauma, we can see this fluid collection, lifting of the occipitalis muscle uh, in this patient with a subgalial fluid collection, a fracture, and even air in the epidural space. Another patient with diffuse scalp soft tissue swelling bilaterally seen on MRI. Uh, the history in this patient uh, was a vaginal delivery a uh, patient uh, uh, with cephalopelvic disproportion and requiring C-section eventually, but because of all the manipulation, this diffuse uh, caput succedaneum type of appearance of scalp soft tissue swelling that we see um, on both sides of the scalp. Moving from the scalp to the skull, uh, next sort of uh, type of lesion that we're going to encounter are the, the various fractures, and these can be uh, linear, uh, diastatic sutural fractures, comminuted fractures, depressed fractures, and basal skull type fractures. So we can see numerous patterns, and we can see combinations of these fractures depending on the extent and severity of the trauma. So this is an example of skull radiographs in a child with a uh, linear skull fracture. And again, note the cephalohematoma at the site of impact. So this is telling you where to look. And plain films are nice because they give you a very nice geographic distribution. And this is uh, my cue to remind you, always look at the scalp radiographs on CT because they are, they are basically uh, a, a, a cheap type of plain film uh, examination. Uh, in this child, we see uh, a cephalohematoma on one side, on the opposite side, on the contra coup area, we see this diastatic uh, fracture of the coronal suture. Underneath it, we see a small uh, epidural uh, hemorrhage. And 3D reformations are very nice at looking at the uh, lambda coronal sagittal sutures. And here we can see the suture asymmetry in this patient. Uh, these are uh, lateral and frontal skull radiographs demonstrated a uh, depressed skull fracture. Look at the amount of displacement of the frontal bone into the anterior cranial fossa in this patient. And obviously this is nicely demonstrated on the bone window axial uh, images and on the uh, brain window images as well with the associated damage to the uh, frontal lobes with hemorrhage and contusion. Fractures can be associated with complications. Remember the dura is adherent to the inner table of the skull. You fracture the bone, you can damage the dura, and you can breach the barrier between the outside world and the brain. Uh, this can predispose to infection, CSF leak, depending if you're close in the skull base to the paranasal sinuses and sinusal cavity, or uh, near the temporal bone, near the tegmin tympani, or the mastoid air cells. Lastly, you can get uh, subtle damage to the dura, uh, herniation, ball valve phenomena, and you can get the creation of what are called leptomeningeal cysts. Uh, this is an example in this case below of a patient who uh, had remote uh, head trauma and just complained of a whooshing sound every time they turned their head. And you can see the lucency over the skull ipsilaterally on the axial CT image you can see the large uh, pneumatocele that developed in the anterior cranial fossa as a result of a breach in the barrier of the dura in this patient. In children uh, who have significant head trauma and skull fractures, you can develop 
uh, what are called abdominal cysts. So acutely, this child had head trauma, had parenchymal damage, a uh, skull fracture, um, and uh, over a period of several months, uh, while the child was recovering from their initial trauma, they developed a bump on their head, and this is a so-called leptomeningeal cyst that develops from this, this breach in the dura, this injury. Uh, a cyst is formed, it grows due to CSF pulsations, and uh, this lesion is also re referred to as a growing fracture. Now, let's move from the skull to some of the extraaxial spaces. And the key structure here to emphasize is the dura model. Lesions above the dura are epidural, beneath it are subdural. Uh, lesions that involve the subarachnoid space that percolates around the sulci, around the large external spaces, the base of the skull, uh, that's subarachnoid uh, type of lesions. And obviously, lesions within the ventricular system are intraventricular. And so, epidural hematomas occur above the dura. They're related to vascular injuries, usually lacerations in the involving the middle meningeal artery as it courses uh, from the foramen spinosum through the middle meningeal groove along the, uh, the temporal uh, squamosa. And uh, the other important fact to remember here is that epidurals can be caused by dural venous sinus injury. So we should never forget that. Um, epidural hematomas are often associated with skull fractures uh, and they can cross the uh, midline at the level of the vertex. These are uh, due to a coup injury. They have a biconvex or lenticular shape uh, as shown on the di coronal diagram above. And on the uh, coronal section pathologic specimen below, you can see the imprint on the side of the frontal temporal cortex in a patient who perished from a large epidural collection. Again, the hemorrhage is located on top or outside of the dura, epidural. And these are the changes it can make uh, in terms of morphologic alteration of the shape of the brain due to uh, mass effect. So on CT, epidural hematomas are hyperdense. Uh, they can have hypodense foci that may reflect active bleeding. They're often associated with fractures. Uh, they can be smaller, large. They're often uh, located in the middle of cranial fossa, but can be seen in other parts of the brain. They can be quite sizable and have significant mass effect. This is an example of an epidural related to damage to the transverse sinus within the posterior fossa. This is one higher up uh, associated with a fracture. On MRI, we rarely see them unless they're tiny ones associated with a venous etiology. Um, and in general, epidural hematomas tend to be imaged on CT and are often going straight uh, to the operating room uh, to be uh, drained uh, uh, by the neurosurgeon. Subdural hematomas occur beneath the dura. They're often associated with head trauma, reflect the sequela of a contracute lesion, and are associated with laceration of the cortical bridging base. This is a coronal contrast enhanced image, uh, which nicely demonstrates these cortical bridging veins. And you can imagine the brain shaking inside of the head and these uh, cables snapping and causing hemorrhage. And again, they're located underneath the dura. And so they follow the inner table of the skull. They have a concave appearance uh, and uh, can cross uh, suture lines. They can be found unilaterally or bilaterally. Uh, they can move around where we have dura. So, uh, 
It can be interhemispheric in location or be located above the tentorium cerebelli, for example. They're often seen at the level of the convexity. The density or attenuation of these uh, subdural collections depends on their timing. Acute lesions, hyperdense, chronic lesions, hypodense, subacute lesions, isodense, and these can be challenging to detect. Uh, patients with a low hematocrit also may have more hypodense collections. And the, uh, these lesions, when imaged with MRI, uh, their appearance will de de certainly depend on how long they've been around, if there's been rehemorrhage, because uh, subdurals can have recurrent hemorrhagic events within the matrix of the collection. And so this is a patient who had head trauma. You see the left frontal uh, acute subdural hematoma. Uh, four weeks later, we see the collection is now hypodense or low attenuation. In this patient, um, we're looking at this. We don't see that typical uh, concave high density collection. But the principle I want to emphasize here is look for sulcal asymmetry. The sulci can help us. On the left side of the brain, we see plenty of sulci. What happened to those sulci on the right side of the brain in this patient? And if we look high in the, con the convexity on subdural windows, we can see uh, a subtle subdural collection. And the teaching points here, look at sulcal effacement, use other window and levels on your workstation to uh, look at these lesions. As I mentioned earlier, they, these lesions can occur bilaterally. Here we have hematocrit levels uh, on each side of, of the brain. Uh, these lesions do show some enhancement um, and the enhancement uh, involves areas of displaced dura and areas of what are called uh, a fibrovascular membrane that develops within the matrix of these collections in, in subdural hematomas. And they can be quite striking in appearance, uh, these, these membranes. And they could, you can get laminated, layered appearances, unusual shapes because of the development of these membranes some of which can give you almost a biconvex appearance in a more chronic uh, subdural collection. And if you resect this, uh, some of these membranes, uh, you will see this fibrovascular tissue. Um, and this is very friable and prone to hemorrhage. So uh, again, patients who have repeat recurrent trauma, say for example, an alcoholic who is falling down who has altered clotting abilities, who has recurrent head trauma. Uh, they develop these membranes, they're friable, they have poor coagulation status. Uh, these are uh, prime candidates for these uh, chronic recurrent uh, uh, subdural uh, collections. Again, another patient in which we see sulci on the right side, we don't see that on the left side of the brain. Something is going on in the left cerebral hemisphere. Uh, we use coronal imaging to confirm that, we tried IV contrast, sometimes that can be helpful on CT. And ultimately we work this out with MRI. We see the low signal on, on T2 associated with a hemorrhage. We see brighter signal on T1 related to methemoglobin effect. And we can see nicely the convexity subdural collection on that side of the brain that corresponds to the CT findings in this patient. Uh, this is a patient who has bilateral subdural collections, more isodense on the right side, uh, more hyperattenuated on the left side. And you can see uh, how these look quite interesting and fascinating on the axial T2 images and on the T1 weighted images with different foci of uh, increased and lower signal uh, showing uh, hemorrhage in different uh, 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 steps of, of, of breakdown. Now, because these uh, extra axial collections have mass effect upon the brain, uh, they can cause uh, herniation. And there are different types of herniation. This is a diagram from Elisa Jean's uh, uh, book on head trauma. And you can see 
uh, this uh, large extraction collection. You can have subfalcine herniation. You can have uncle herniation or transcentorial herniation. You can have um, extracranial herniation and you can have tonsil herniation. And this mass effect can press on arteries and cause ischemia. And this is an example of bilateral posterior cerebral artery uh, ischemia in a patient who had a large subdural collection that was drained, but uh, it wasn't drained fast enough, unfortunately, and the patient developed bilateral occipital infarcts. Uh, this patient fell out of a hospital bed, was unresponsive, had a history of alcoholic liver disease, and you can see just a few hours after their event, uh, they're unresponsive, and you can see this huge uh, collection with major subfalcine herniation uh, at the level of the supracellar cistern. You can see uh, this uncle herniation. This is actually the temporal horn uh, right next to the brainstem. Uh, severe transitorial herniation. We can't cannot make out the basal cisterns in this patient. And this is also confirmed on the coronal uh, reformats in this patient. Note the, the layered appearance of these recurrent uh, hemorrhages in this patient with acute and, uh, acute and early acute uh, components. So uh, we spent a bit of time on uh, subdurals and epidurals for a reason, because it's really important to appreciate these. Uh, when we recognize them, we contact our clinical colleagues immediately to initiate some kind of therapeutic uh, intervention uh, as deemed clinically necessary, particularly with the epidural collections. Again, uh, epidurals tend to be associated with coup injuries or subdural contra coup. Uh, epidurals, arterial injuries, uh, for the most part, uh, torn cortical bridging veins and subdurals. Uh, other injuries, fractures with epidurals, um, hemorrhages with subdurals within the brain, middle cranial fossa location for the epidural, convexity for the subdural, unilateral for the epidural, unilateral or bilateral for subdurals, uh, suture limited epidural, uh, not suture limited subdural, biconvex shaped epidural, concave shaped subdural, uh, increased density epidural, and variable density depending on timing of the event uh, with respect to subdurals. And these are just general statements there uh, are collections that don't always read this chart. Subdural hygromas are related to arachnoid tears. These are CSF, true CSF collections uh, within the, within the uh, head. Um, they're low attenuation on CT, equivalent to uh, the CSF within the ventricular system, well-defined, and they're related to a ball valve phenomenon in which um, there's communication somewhere with the subarachnoid space, CSF pulsations, and these things start to grow and create a uh, mass effect. Um, in this particular case, a drain was placed in this collection and contrast was injected at the request of the neurosurgeon to show the communication with the middle uh, cerebral artery cistern. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is head trauma. And subarachnoid hemorrhage can present either diffusely or focally. Um, while it can occur as an isolated finding, it's most often seen in association with significant uh, head trauma. And now, these are examples of, of focal uh, areas of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, this is a, an autopsy specimen showing the same. Um, you can have subarachnoid hemorrhage due to heel vessel injury uh, or extension from uh, another source of intracerebral hemorrhage or interventricular hemorrhage. Uh, certainly, we see this quite readily on CT, but we can sometimes see it on, on MRI. Uh, and subarachnoid hemorrhage is obviously associated with vasospasm, cerebral ischemia, and the development of hydrocephalus. And this is a gentleman uh, with focal subarachnoid hemorrhages uh, following a fall. 
um, in patients who have intraventricular hemorrhage, um, we can see uh, this hemorrhage uh, within the ventricles as a result of reflux from the subarachnoid space or extension from a focal parenchymal hemorrhage. It's important to keep in mind though that uh, if you have a, a tear of uh, subependymal veins related to shear injury, um, there can be other findings uh, that you can see within the scan. And this patient indeed had diffuse axonal injury uh, as shown on the other uh, CT images with, with, with these arrows. So uh, this, these um, uh, uh, interventricular hemorrhages can be an indirect sign of shear injury. And that's an important point that you should remember. Other intracerebral lesions, diffuse axonal injury, contusion and parenchymal hematoma. Let's take a look at a couple of these. Uh, diffuse axonal injury is related to, uh, again, this shear phenomenon, this unequal rotation are related to uh, deceleration and acceleration of, of adjacent uh, tissues, uh, can be diffuse and bilateral, and these can be uh, very uh, devastating uh, injuries uh, to the patient. Um, we will often see lesions uh, within the lobar white matter at the cortical medullary junction within the corpus callosum as shown on this gross coronal pathologic section in the dorsal lateral brainstem as shown on this autopsy uh, specimen below. Um, you can see areas of hemorrhage or low attenuation on CT uh, in, in areas where we don't commonly uh, encounter parenchymal hemorrhages. These are often at gray white junctions or deep within the brain parenchyma as shown in this older case. Um, on CT, the majority of these lesions uh, escape detection. What we're seeing on this scan is only the tip of the iceberg. And certainly um, MRI is very sensitive to these uh, lesions, particularly our uh, susceptibility weighted imaging sequences. And, and we can certainly use uh, diffusion tractography as well to, to look at these uh, cases are uh, very helpful. And, and the more you look, the more you find. And again, that's what they look like at uh, gross pathologic inspection involving the white matter in the corpus callosum. This is a, a recent case uh, from our institution, a patient who was assaulted. You can see the small punctate hemorrhagic foci uh, at the cortical medullary junctions in the deep basal ganglia. And you can see them throughout the brain parenchyma. And the more, again, the more you look, uh, the more you find. Uh, same patient on flare imaging, you see some subtle foci of high signal intensity at the gray white junction. These are DAI type lesions. And again, the value of susceptibility weighted imaging, just numerous uh, lesions in this patient who was devastated uh, by uh, this assault. Contusions are very common post-traumatic lesions. Uh, they reflect the fact that the brain is basically, basically banging up against the inner table of the skull at the base of the anterior cranial fossa or the skull base or the middle cranial fossa, the petrous temporal bone, et cetera, and reflects direct impact. Uh, occurs at the cortical surface associated with other injuries uh, uh, related to trauma. And remember that contusions are essentially uh, bruises on the brain surface uh, with proximity to the skull vault and the skull base. Because the question is, how do we distinguish uh, a contusion from uh, an intracerebral hematoma? And that, that is answered by uh, the location relative to the surface of the brain and also by the fact that contusion reflects, re reflects damaged parenchyma, torn vessels, and it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a combination injury to the brain parenchyma. A hematoma is a focal collection of blood that can also be associated with some damage to the surroundings. 
area. And again, these, uh, these small vessels are torn, they hemorrhage. Um, they, we often see these contusions along the inferior frontal lobes, involving the opercula of the frontal lobes, involving also the temporal opercula. They can involve the, the base of the temporal lobes inferiorly. Uh, they can also be seen uh, in the cerebellum and dorsal lateral segment of the brainstem. And this is an example of a small contusion uh, related to uh, impact of this portion of the temporal lobe against the petrous apex. Uh, this is a patient who was involved in a motor vehicle collision. And you can see this small focal uh, temporal percular hemorrhage, hemorrhagic contusion, which gets more prominent uh, about eight hours later on repeat scanning and is associated with a small uh, extraxial hemorrhagic collection and uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage extending into the ciliary fissure. On MRI, we, we find contusions in that classic location. Again, the frontal opercula, temporal opercula, uh, inferior frontal lobes, where there's impact against the anterior skull base. You can see that on uh, gradient coronal and, and T2 axial images. And again, notice the correlation between this contusion, the pathologic coronal section and the MRI coronal section. A hematoma is a well-defined hemorrhagic mass that tends to displace neurons, occurs between neurons and tends to be located uh, deeper within the brain. Um, these uh, are very interesting lesions. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to separate from the contusion, but you can see this one here is a bit uh, deeper. And over time, uh, they certainly can get quite uh, sizable. This one is 24 hours later, and certainly there are multiple factors involved in the evolution of these very complex hematomas, including uh, uh, coagulopathy and, and uh, abnorm or abnormalities related to, to vascular tone. These uh, uh, hemorrhages can also involve the dorsal lateral brainstem. And again, it, uh, here we see a focal collection of blood that, that grew within 24 hours um, at the level of the midbrain uh, in this patient. It must be kept in mind that there are other brainstem injuries that are associated with intracerebral hemorrhage. Earlier, we mentioned the fuse axonal injury. Um, we, we saw an example of contusion. We just saw an intracerebral uh, hemorrhage or hematoma. And then there's the classic uh, Duray hemorrhage, which reflects uh, stretching of the pontine perforators from the basal artery, uh, leading to these um, hemorrhages deep within the paramedian uh, aspect of the, of the brainstem uh, in patients uh, who are suffering uh, cerebral uh, herniation syndromes. And this is uh, a recent case from our institution from a couple of weeks ago, patient with a large uh, subdural hemorrhage, cerebral herniation. This is, this is the temporal horn on the axial image. You can see the cephalantoma, and 24 hours later, he was being, he had the subdural drain, but developed this hemorrhage at the level of the pons in a paramedian location, as shown on the sagittal reformation, a deray hemorrhage due to an arterial injury uh, as a result of herniation. Vascular injuries. Uh, these constitute all types of lesions, the sections with, with or without pseudoaneurysms, lacerations uh, to, to, to arter arteries, uh, venous or dural venous sinus tears, and fistulous formation, either uh, direct between the cavernous carotid artery and the cavernous sinus, or at the level of the dura with dural arterial, post traumatic dural arterial venous fistulas. And this, these, these are all different patients. Just I want to give you an idea of a spectrum of vascular injuries that can occur in the head and neck. 
And we have to think head and neck for head trauma because what's going on in the cervical vasculature will impact on what we're seeing uh, within the brain in an acute and subacute and chronic um, uh, 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 chronologic order. So uh, on this lateral uh, angiogram, we can see that there is clot within the internal carotid artery distal cervical segment. At the skull base, we see the beginning of dissection with thin contour of the cervical internal carotid artery. We see enlargement focally and irregularity of the contour of the cervical internal carotid artery in another patient, lateral projection with a filling def defect, a clot. Uh, on these MRI views on one side, we see a vascular cutoff uh, of the internal carotid artery at the skull base. And on these lateral angiographic images, we can see a major contour change, almost a string sign of the cervical internal car carotid artery, which is even narrower than, for example, the occipital artery in this patient. So those, those are different types of arterial dissection manifestations on imaging. Uh, you can get pseudo aneurysm formation, uh, either with uh, trauma or with, uh, with uh, non-penetrating or penetrating trauma, as in this case, which was required uh, stent uh, treatment. Um, this was a patient who developed a posterior inferior cerebellar infarct uh, as a result of an arterial dissection of the vertebral artery. And we can see the small uh, pseudo aneurysm in this dissected vessel at the skull base in this patient. Another patient with a vertebral pseudoaneurysm, post-traumatic, and not an ischemic event, but a hemorrhagic event, a large, uh, predominantly posterior fossa, subarachnoid hemorrhage on CT, and the, art the angiogram, a left vertebral artery injection, demonstrates this focal outpouching of the uh, distal vertebral artery, which uh, we can see at the time of operation, there's the uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and there's the small pseudoaneurysm, which nicely matches the appearance of what we're seeing angiographically. This is a patient, 13-year-old who had head trauma, uh, was in the intensive care unit, and several days later, decompensated, developed this intracerebral uh, hemorrhage with intraventricular extension, and the lateral angiogram was performed, demonstrates this large pseudoaneurysm at the level of the pericolosal artery. There's the pseudoaneurysm on the, uh, at, at the time of operation. Carotid cavernous fistula, uh, patient shot in the face, uh, bullet fragments going into the skull base near the carotid canal. Uh, the left uh, common carotid artery was injected in this patient. We see predominantly external carotid artery branches. We don't see much filling of the, at the level of the internal carotid artery in this patient. Uh, the right carotid artery is injected, cross-filling through the anti-communicating artery. And that supraclient or internal carotid artery is a reflux with filling of the cavernous internal carotid artery on the damaged side. And then we see early venous filling in a patient with a projectile injury related uh, carotid cavernous fistula. Uh, this patient uh, was stabbed in the neck, and this is a near transection of the proximal internal carotid artery at the carotid bifurcation in a patient with a large neck hematoma surrounding uh, that vessel. Those are arterial injuries. You can also damage venous structures, patient with a skull base fracture that goes right through the sigmoid sinus and uh, jugular fossa. And the angiogram nicely demonstrates occlusion of the ipsilateral transverse sinus on that side. 
Uh, what happens here is on the Venus phase of the uh, lateral projection from the cerebral angiogram, the flow of contrast is away from this area, is going forward and working its way into the superior ophthalmic vein and into the anterior facial veins to drain into the external jugular vein because of this occluded, traumatized, dominant dural venous pathway. This is a young patient status post fall. We can see that the patient has an epidural hematoma near the convexity, interesting location with acute hemorrhage. And six hours later, look at this marked expansion of that collection related to damage to the superior uh, sagittal sinus. So we alluded earlier that you can have uh, secondary lesions. Um, we've talked about infection, lymphomeningeal cysts. Certainly you can damage, uh, get, get cranial nerve dysfunction as a result of skull base injury. And with respect to cerebral edema, uh, it eventually ends up in many cases as cerebral ischemia. And that can reflect direct parechymal injury, hypoxic injury, some of the vascular injuries that we've just demonstrated, embolic phenomena, not just from the head and neck vessels, but even from long bone fractures, such as fatty emboli or vasospasm. And as we saw earlier with some of those extra oxygen collections, mass effect uh, on vessels with subsequent uh, infarcts uh, related to occlusion of those vessels by mass effect. And cerebral edema manifests as loss of the gray-white uh, interface, which we can nicely demonstrate on MRI. And with increased swelling, uh, there's increased mass effect, increased herniation syndromes, and a poorer neurologic uh, prognosis. Uh, this is a young man who was involved in um, a uh, motorcycle accident. You can see the sequela of the intracranial injury and the cephalohematoma in this patient and these hemorrhagic foci due to the few axonal injury within the brain on the CT image. And within a couple of days, you can see the diffuse uh, loss of normal gray-white interface, uh, diffuse cerebral edema uh, in, this, in this patient who uh, succumbed uh, to his injuries. A quick note on abusive head trauma for, for a few more minutes. Um, in these patients, obviously, we will see a full spectrum of traumatic brain lesions, but the most common is subdural hematoma. We will see ischemia, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, and fractures, fractures that may uh, abut adjacent suture lines, fractures that may cross suture lines. We should suspect the diagnosis when we see multiple lesions, unusual lesion locations, and different ages of the lesions, and this is where MRI can be helpful. And obviously, we should not look at these cases in a vacuum. Um, these patients will have skeletal surveys, chest x-rays, et cetera, and we should see the, uh, the rib injuries that are typical with these posterior rib injuries that are typical uh, in these cases. Uh, as well as the um, uh, characteristic uh, long bone fractures uh, that can be identified uh, in these patients. And so this is a very recent case in a child that uh, allegedly fell and had a seizure. And uh, shortly after the fall and seizure, which was only maybe a few hours before this scan was performed, this is what we're looking at, bilateral uh, subdural collections. I was trying to see if I could see retinal hemorrhages. I didn't on the CT, but clinically, these were detected on uh, uh, ophthalmoscopy. And on the chrome images, we can see these bilateral subdural collections. We could see focal soft tissue swelling over the vertex, and there was a uh, focal uh, soft tissue swelling seen laterally. Uh, 
look at the Scout CT images carefully. And you have to kind of look through this, these, these blankets that are placed around the child's head. And we can see a line that just doesn't belong there. And we look at the Braun window algorithm, access to images, and identify uh, fracture through the uh, parietal uh, bone. And the 3D reformations are very nice in terms of, of identifying these fracture lines and seeing their extent, sagittal suture, lamboid suture, occipital bone, parietal bone, and there's the fracture. And so, again, look at the scouts and the 3Ds can be helpful. Um, the child had this, uh, this collection drained, uh, but unfortunately, um, despite aggressive intervention, uh, you can see the development of uh, diffuse cerebral edema and ischemia. And you can see the attenuation difference between the cerebellum and the cerebrum in this uh, poor child. And again, um, this is what we want to avoid seeing, uh, the sequelae of these, these uh, hypoxic uh, ischemic injuries to the brain with just relative sparing of the brain stem and the cerebellum in these kids. So if you look at findings that might suggest abuse of head trauma, again, think about those subdural hematomas, especially if they're different ages, uh, unilateral ischemic events in young children, retinal hemorrhages, fractures with intracranial injuries, the so-called tap fold sign where you see injured or thrombosed, uh, bridging cortical veins, uh, parenchymal lacerations, retroclival hemorrhages, and um, uh, 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 cortical injury of the brain. So we've looked at a classification scheme with respect to timing, type of injury, mechanism, lesion, location. We started from the scalp, worked our way to the skull, to, to intracranial, to these extra and intraaxial collections. And we certainly can't forget intent. Um, this classification scheme is often combined. So there can be a primary lesion uh, that's the result of penetrating trauma with extracranial, cranial, intracranial injury that is intentional and certainly non-accidental um, and has forensic and legal implications as a result. And, and at, in addition to um, uh, clinical complications, uh, lesion types, uh, we've talked about the, the value of the cephalohematoma, uh, the, the distinction between epidurals and subdurals above or below the dura, um, the different types of hemorrhages elsewhere within the other compartment, uh, diffuse axonal injury as a form of shear injury, and the vascular injuries that can be caused by some of these lesions or can cause these lesions. And we had a focus on uh, abusive head trauma because that is certainly one area where as radiologists and neuroradiologists, we can certainly uh, have an immediate impact, not only on uh, management, uh, but also as part of the evaluation and in, in helping to uh, prognosticate. So in any event, uh, from Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx, New York, uh, this is my Bronx tale. These are a few uh, helpful uh, references that uh, I highly recommend that you take a look at. And I certainly uh, thank uh, Health for the World for the opportunity uh, to present this lecture. And uh, certainly happy to uh, try to address any questions that may come up at this moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz, for the incredible lecture. I uh, just want to let everyone know that all the lectures are available on our YouTube channel, uh, channel and uh, also on our website. So we already have three questions. The first one, um, how can cephalohematoma be differentiated from subgaleal hematoma on CT? Uh, number one, the cephalohematoma remember is related to the, to the, it occurs under the pericranium. So anatomically, the pericranium is adherent to sutures. So this cephalohematoma is going to be suture delimited and it's gonna be relatively focal. 
the um, the uh, subgalial collection. It's beneath the Galia aponeurotica. That is an aponeurosis that is located between the bellies of the frontalis and occipitalis muscles. So a collection for that tends to be uh, much more uh, larger, not suture delimited, and um, uh, you can see it relative uh, to those structures. So in the, in, now in the era of multiplanar imaging where you, it's easy to perform reformations on workstations, et cetera, uh, you can certainly use that uh, to tease it out. Um, we will see, number one, uh, cephalohematomas more commonly than the subgale collection. That's another thing. Um, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, we have to keep in mind that subgale collections can also occur in a post-surgical uh, setting after folks have had, for example, craniotomies and craniectomies. Thank you. Um, can subgaleal hematoma occur in the frontal region? Um, yes, because they, they go underneath. Uh, they can displace the frontalis muscle as they go underneath. And, and so they're, they're, they, they can go pretty far forward. And they, they often, you know, if I can turn my head like that, uh, they can, they, they kind of have that, that, uh, that manifestation. So for chronic hematoma, do you recommend CT or MR? Uh, it depends on the patient's clinical presentation, obviously. Uh, they have to be stable enough to uh, undergo and be placed in an MR environment. Um, obviously, I think the, because of the availability, uh, a CT should be performed uh, first, if you can, algorithmically, uh, to get an idea of the size of the collection. Um, uh, and uh, what it's doing to the adjacent structures, because not only are we concerned about the collection, but we're concerned about the mass effect. And so again, uh, the imaging algorithm and sequence are definitely influenced very strongly by the patient's clinical presentation. Now, certainly if, if additional imaging is required and uh, MR can be used in a problem solving capacity. But certainly um, uh, if, if you're thinking about imaging a chronic subdural collection or, or, or doing something about it, it's based on, 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 that, on that issue itself. What are you going to do once you see the collection? Are you going to drain it or not? So, so that will be a factor that influences how you image and that will influence Again, whether you go to CT or MR, but because of availability and, and, and other safety issues, I think a CT is a quick study to give you an idea of what's going on uh, with this collection. Uh, if it's um, something more than that, as in some of the cases that I've shown, um, you, you get a, um, uh, an MR sometimes. So the next one, um, how do you differentiate chronic SDH versus hydroma? Um, great question. Remember, a true hygroma is the sequela of an arachnoid tear. So there really will not be, there should not be if you want to be a purist. Now, you know, you could be a lumper or a splitter. I tend to be a splitter. So for me, a hygroma is CSF in that in a subdural hygroma in that subdural space. So it should follow CSF attenuation characteristics on CT and CSF signal characteristics on MR. If you start seeing like a significant like hematocrit level or, or areas of hemorrhage within this thing, then maybe you're dealing with a chronic uh, subdural hematoma. And if you notice, there was that case where I showed the patient four weeks later after they had their, their initial front, uh, frontal acute subdural hematoma, it became less, less dense. Well, it, that, even though it was less dense, the attenuation of that subdural collection was still greater than the attenuation of the CSF within the ventricular system. So you can use those qualitative measurements. You can, you can put ROIs, measure attenuation on CT and compare the attenuation 
of the CSF in the bodies of the lateral ventricle to the attenuation of the collection. And hopefully they'll be similar. Perfect. So those were the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz. And thank you everyone for attending our webinar. Hopefully um, we'll see Dr. Ortiz and everyone else uh, in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. You guys have a great day and a great evening wherever you are. Be blessed. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.